Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you here today to this talk on whether or not ASEAN matters or how it matters. Um, my name is Anne Marie Murphy. I'm a senior research scholar here at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. And on behalf of the Institute and the New York Southeast Asian Network, I am delighted to uh, welcome you here today. And it is my distinct honor to introduce you to Dr. Marty Nadalagawa. Um, Dr. Nadalagawa, as many of you know, had an illustrious career. Uh, in the field of diplomacy, culminating uh, in his service as the Foreign Minister of Indonesia from 2009 to 2014. During his tenure as Foreign Minister, he guided Indonesia's 2011 Chairmanship of ASEAN, in which capacity he oversaw the expansion of the East Asian Summit to include the U.S. and Russia. Earlier in his career, Dr. Natalagawa served as Indonesia's permanent representative to the UN, during which time he also served as president of the UN Security Council. Earlier than that, <laughs> he served as ambassador to uh, Great Britain and Ireland. Um, Dr. Natalagawa received his PhD from the Australian National University. Since retiring from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Natalagawa has kept up a very uh, busy and impressive schedule, serving on a number of high-level UN panels, as well as a member of the United Nations President of the General Assembly's team of expert advisors. He's currently a distinguished fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute and serves on the board of advisors for many prominent organizations, including the International Crisis Group and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, Dr. Natalagawa is an old friend of Columbia. Uh, he spoke here a number of times during his tenure uh, at the UN. He also gave a keynote address uh, at a Columbia or, uh, conference in uh, Indonesia. So we are delighted to welcome Dr. Natalagawa back to campus today as one of the things he's done in his retirement, which is write this book, Does ASEAN Matter? A View from Within. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Nadalagawa. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Murphy, for, for your kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for your uh, interest uh, for uh, this occasion. I'm extremely uh, grateful to the Institute for making this uh, uh, event possible. And I'm keen to be able to share with you some thoughts uh, but on ASEAN, but most of all to be able to exchange views and to interact and to discuss uh, on issues of common concerns uh, to all of us. Uh, indeed, as described, I have been uh, reflecting on ASEAN in, a, in, a, in the recent past, uh, reflecting essentially on the issue, on the question, uh, does ASEAN matter? Uh, it, it may seem uh, redundant uh, because it seems quite self-evident that ASEAN has mattered. But uh, in posing the question, I am more, uh, I aim more towards identifying what's left to be done, what ASEAN needs to, to do to continue to be of, of relevance. Because if one was to look back over the past uh, five decades of ASEAN, uh, at, at the risk of uh, oversimplification, there have been a number of quite seminal and quite fundamental contributions that ASEAN has made over the decades. Uh, one uh, cluster or one area uh, through which or by which ASEAN has been uh, of significance has been in transforming the relationship between countries of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, because one need to recall that prior to 1967, countries of Southeast Asia were either in open conflict with one another, but actually as well, there were at least a sense of animosity and tensions and distrust among them. A trust <coughs> deficit is a term that I had used to describe the situation prevailing then. But through ASEAN of five decades long, we have seen transformation in the relationship among Southeast Asian countries. Uh, trust deficit has been replaced by strategic trust uh, in such a way that nowadays uh, it, it's almost become unthinkable for countries of the region of Southeast Asia to come to uh, open conflict among themselves. I'm not saying that the 
problems are all entirely resolved or solved, but at least there is now a se greater sense of community, a greater sense of uh, uh, trust prevalent among them. And this of the attainment of transformation in intra-Southeast Asian relationship uh, did not come uh, just out of the blue, but it, ha it needed to be, they needed to, to be uh, deliberate and purposeful attempt by Southeast Asian countries through ASEAN to change the dynamics. Uh, I will simply illustrate some uh, by way of examples. For instance, the decision in 1976 to promulgate or to achieve the so-called Treaty of Amity and Cooperation uh, among Southeast Asian countries. This is a, a seminal agreement whereupon countries of Southeast Asia agree that they will uh, henceforth resolve problems amongst themselves or, or difficult uh, differences among them through the non-use of force, through peaceful settlement of disputes. Uh, at a time when problems was really prevalent and the use of force was very much uh, the norm, this commitment in 1976 was quite uh, game-changing uh, in transforming the dynamics in Southeast Asia. Uh, as well, since then, uh, we have had uh, agreement between uh, amongst the ASEAN countries to expand ASEAN from the original five to include all the all the ASEAN so-called ASEAN ten. Uh, this has also been a seminal and transformational uh, development because prior to ASEAN ten, we had two Southeast Asia, uh, one. Uh, uh, or involving the original ASEAN five countries and then the so-called CLMV countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and, and Vietnam. Uh, that uh, type of uh, dualism within Southeast Asia was addressed by having an ASEAN 10, again, transformative in nature. And not least of all, the, the decision to begin the ASEAN community in 2005-2003 which was attained in 2015, was also important and transformational uh, to raise the level of ASEAN cooperation from an association to becoming a community. In short, ASEAN transformative in changing the dynamics in relations among Southeast Asian countries, from animosity to trust, uh, from trust deficit to strategic trust. Uh, the second cluster where I think uh, ASEAN has been uh, uh, of impact is in the broader region, uh, broader scheme of things. Because prior to ASEAN, countries of Southeast Asia was, were very much pawns in major power rivalries. Uh, we had then, of course, the so-called East-West rivalry, Cold War conflict, the United States, Soviet Union, of course, with a very prominent role and a special uh, role of China, where countries of Southeast Asia were had their own problems magnified by the uh, projection of major power interests direct or proxy to the, uh, to the environment. Through ASEAN, we saw transformation where countries of ASEAN, uh, countries of Southeast Asia, through ASEAN, earn centrality in our region. Uh, henceforth, all the major regional architecture activities, regional architect architecture building in Southeast Asia has an ASEAN footprint, an ASEAN uh, imprint, whether it be the uh, so-called ASEAN Plus process, ASEAN with China, ASEAN with Korea, with India and the like, with the dialogue partners, the ASEAN Plus 3 process, ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, tremendous uh, demonstration of at least ASEAN's convening power. Uh, the ability, this is especially pertinent when you recall this was in the immediate post-Cold War era, where uh, there was a great deal of uncertainty what post-Cold uh, War uh, architecture dynamics will be, and ASEAN provided the wherewithal, provided the, the home, so to speak, for countries of the region to come together in a win-win common security outlook. In other words, once Southeast Asian countries were pawns in major power rivalries, and through ASEAN, Collectively, they have earned a leadership, uh, a centrality, and a driving seat position. And last but not least, through ASEAN, uh, ASEAN has mattered in the sense of uh, driving home the message of a people-centered ASEAN. Uh, 
colleagues would no doubt be aware that prior to not too long ago, there was a time when Southeast Asian economies were the, in the most uh, uh, dire of state in terms of uh, its eco the economic underdevelopment that was prevalent, the, po the high level of poverty that was prevalent. I'm not saying, of course, that that uh, all are, all these challenges have been resolved, but through ASEAN, we have seen transformation of the economies of Southeast Asia as becoming one of the most robust, one of the most uh, dynamic in, in the world, uh, where we have seen, for instance, some 30-fold increase in the GDP per capita of uh, as collectively of ASEAN economies. ASEAN economies' role in the global economy is increasingly important and significant. Transformation in the economic domain, which after all is the most important, amongst the most important uh, uh, of import and relevance to the, the peoples of ASEAN. But more than material uh, benefits, uh, especially since 2003 when Indonesia proposed the idea of an ASEAN political security community, we recognize that a people-centered ASEAN is not simply about material economic uh, well-being. Uh, the idea of uh, good governance, the idea of human rights, respect for, become, became to be introduced in ASEAN lexicon, ASEAN discourse, clearly in, uh, very much work in progress. We have seen in recent months, for instance, some regression in the de democratic architecture, in my view, in Southeast Asia. But at the very least, there is an, an attempt to make ASEAN more people relevant people focus and even people driven. All that's of the past, but I'm more interested really to reflect of on the future, whether the type of positive trajectory that we've had over the past five decades can be sustained, uh, is now, can continue to be, to, be, to be the trend for the future. And this is uh, where I think upon reflection I came to the conclusion that while ASEAN has mattered, has been relevant, uh, if we were to continue to be of relevance and to continue to matter, then more of the same uh, would not suffice. Uh, ASEAN would, would really need to up its game, and would really need to continue to develop its transformative outlook to remain relevant. And let me, uh, you know, before I conclude and we have some discussion, just illustrate with some, some uh, examples of what I mean. For instance, on the issue of uh, intra-Southeast Asia relationship, relationship between Southeast Asian countries. I have mentioned just now how ASEAN has made possible the transformation in the relationship among Southeast Asian countries, but uh, there, ca there cannot be any sense of complacency here. Uh, you know, nowadays, ASEAN has uh, almost a situation of a paradox of plenty. We have many institutions, many agreements, and wherewithal uh, that's supposed to govern and that's supposed to guide relationship among ASEAN countries. But in many instances, when problem uh, arises between Southeast Asian countries, those very same institutions and capabilities have not been invoked. They have not been utilized. They have remained dormant. They have remained basically potentials rather than of actual relevance. So here, the trust deficit that I speak of before is no longer between countries of Southeast Asia, but increasingly trust deficit of, on the very institutions that we have ourselves created. A lot of these institutions are there with, with tremendous uh, potentials and possibilities, but a great hesitancy to actually employ them. Uh, for instance, the TAC, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation that I, I speak of earlier, identify the possibility of having a council uh, of Southeast Asian countries, of ASEAN countries, to mediate, to facilitate disputes among Southeast Asian countries. But on the whole, it has remained dormant. It has never been invoked. When disputes arise among Southeast Asian countries, in most cases, it's been taken elsewhere. Malaysia and, and Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia had a dispute over the islands of Sipadan and Ligitan. We take it to the International Court of Justice, ICJ. Likewise, Singapore and Malaysia also took their disputes over some islands to the ICJ as well. Uh, this is perfectly fine and there's no one size fits all that we don't have to force a regional solution on every issue. But what concerns me is that there is a rush to find solutions other than regional solution. 
the notable exception in recent years was the Thailand Cambodia uh, conflict in 2011 uh, at which time Indonesia was sharing ASEAN but even then the ASEAN engagement required a great deal of prodding and a great deal of hand holding on Indonesia's part it would not have happened uh, without Indonesia actually proactively pushing for an ASEAN relevance on the, on the script. Unfortunately, that kind of motivation, that kind of momentum and dynamics uh, can quickly dissipate and can quickly grind to a halt without constant nurturing and prodding. Hence, for instance, now on the issue of uh, uh, Myanmar uh, in terms of the developments in the state of Rakhine, for instance. Uh, we are seeing ASEAN, of course, speaking of it and, and expressing its opinion on the issue, but of hardly of hard um, minimum impact within uh, globally at the United Nations, for instance. ASEAN is perfectly divided on the Myanmar issue. We have, when the resolution was brought to the United Nations General Assembly, we have Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei supporting the resolution. Thailand and, and Singapore abstaining on the resolution and the rest expressing opposition to the resolution. Now, uh, this kind of uh, perfect division, uh, disharmony by ASEAN uh, doesn't, doesn't reflect well on its relevance. So, uh, there is, in other words, now no longer institutional deficit within ASEAN because we have the wherewithal, but there is potentially, potentially, seemingly a leadership deficit because countries are unwilling to actually utilize the very instruments that they have themselves created uh, and and there is hesitancy and therefore there is a, like a cred credibility gap i think this is must be addressed properly secondly on the issue of uh, the second cluster asean and the wider region uh, no one has ever pretended that as Southeast Asian countries have uh, a uniform foreign policy outlook. If from the very beginning, we, we recognize that we bring together countries of uh, varying sorts. Some are very closely aligned to the United States. Some are very closely aligned to China. Some are choosing to be independent or to be non-aligned uh, in this type of dynamics. Uh, but in the past, we have been able to live with such a variation and actually make the variation as a source of our strength. Uh, because we are so varied in our foreign policy outlook, we, were, we can engender comfort level from all parties. We have been able, as I said before, to have a convening power. We have been able to set the rules and norms for our region, probably because all the major powers feel we are, we are you know, there is a, Def uh, by default almost, that we are they have, they have comfort level towards ASEAN. But now I'm seeing a situation where ASEAN countries are losing the finesse to be able to manage this sort of differences. I don't want to use the word differences, but more variation. Losing the finesse in being able to reach equilibrium between the different interests and as if we either have to be with one or with the other. I, I, some people use the term hedging, but I'm not really comfortable with the term hedging because it suggests a very opportunistic and, and short-term uh, outlook. But ASEAN's business has been the business of striking equilibrium, making sure that all these different dynamics, not only US-China, but also China-India, China-Japan, Korea-Japan, somehow it works to, to ASEAN's advantage. Uh, you know, the more problems there are out there, the more likely it is that ASEAN will be the least objectionable party by all parties concerned and we can get things done. But for that to be of consequence, we need to deliver on the substance. Uh, we need to be more than simply a convening event organizer. Uh, this is where I think we are now a little bit uh, at at the moment. We are as extremely efficient and effective in organizing events but we need to deliver on the geopolitics, on the geopolitical outlooks to be thought leaders in our region. And uh, uh, case in point, the Indo-Pacific. Up till 2013, 2014, ASEAN had a script on the Indo-Pacific. Countries in, of I in, South, in the Indian Ocean Rim countries, such as India, Australia, that already reflects 
an Indo-Pacific outlook. But then ASEAN, for reasons only known to itself, chose in 2014 onwards to, to have a pause, to stop thinking outside the region, essentially, and to, to stop to have a pause in the conversation until President Trump went to the region in October 2017 and started speaking of the Indo-Pacific, until Australia started to speak of Indo-Pacific, and now, thankfully, it's better late than never, uh, ASEAN begin to, to resume where they left off. They begin to think again, once again, what the Indo-Pacific means. So, uh, again, the point that I'm trying to make to illustrate is that as in intra-Southeast Asia relationship, in the relationship with the wider region, uh, more of the same, or standing at the, on the same spot, uh, standing still is not an option. Uh, standing still means you are going backward, because the world uh, is changing, is moving on, and ASEAN must be proactive, must be transformative, must be, must be relevant, to be of relevance. I have suggested in the book that we have to have a very clear definition of what are the nature of the problems and opportunities in our region so that we have a, the right type of response, uh, not to have a, the other way around where we have a response looking for a problem. Uh, we have a, a policies looking for a problem, looking for opportunities to try to correlate the two. Uh, I think we are still missing in Southeast Asia a proper brainstorming of what actually makes the region tick. What are the problems in our area? In the past, in the book that I've, I've written, I have identified simply at the risk of oversimplification at least two. One is trust deficit. We have, notwithstanding the, pro, the uh, proliferation of all kinds of processes, ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN itself, ASEAN Plus, uh, and despite notwithstanding within Southeast Asia, we have strategic trust beyond Southeast Asia, we are seeing trust deficit among the major players, North Korea, in Korean Peninsula, US, China, China, India, China, Japan. How do you address these trust deficits? How do you prevent the trust deficit to become more serious and, and feed into the negatively into the dynamics of the region? I believe that one way, in the same way that Southeast Asia's trust deficit was resolved in the past, we need to have some kind of a commitment Irrespective of our differences, we need to solve these problems peacefully. Non-use of force, putting forth dialogue, non-use of force as the only solution to all these problems. You know, I mean, Southeast Asia in 1976 was also similarly uh, uh, divided, and yet the leaders at the time were able to have the courage to set a new tone. Now, that's why I spoken in the past of having a treaty of amity and cooperation like uh, commitment for the wider region, for East Asia Summit. Imagine if countries such as India and China can say, look, we have so many problems among us, but one thing for sure, we are not going to use force to resolve disputes among us. United States and China, China and Japan. Immediate decompressing effect, immediate uh, build confidence building impact. Uh, in the same way that South East Asia. In other words, to, to globalize or to widen the ASEAN experience uh, uh, on the TAC. And the second point, and I will be very quick to, to come to a conclusion, is on the idea of having a crisis management capacity. Uh, things happen in our part of the world at such a speed, whether it be positive or negative. Uh, ASEAN cannot rely on the routine calendar of meetings. Uh, January, a retreat, uh, May, April, a summit, July, a foreign minister's meeting, and November, another summit. Things happen between these this, uh, uh, meetings that needs to be responded, that needs to be anticipated, that needs to be shaped and molded in a positive way. But we have a, a, a lacune we have a void of any crisis management capacity. Uh, you know, when things happen, you have to wait an entire three or four months before leaders meet or ministers meet in some one of the ASEAN capital for them to pronounce themselves 
whether they are happy or they are unhappy with these developments. But we need more than simply a running commentary uh, to developments that have taken that have already taken place. To be of relevance, we need, in my view, to have a Peace and Security Council of the East Asia Summit. Uh, a council of the type that meets permanently in Jakarta, with all the ambassadors of ASEAN ambassadors. ASEAN already has ambassadors to the ASEAN Secretariat. The East Asian Summit countries also have ambassadors to the ASEAN Secretariat. They should meet on a regular basis, every week, with a permanent agenda review of international and regional developments. So there's no one will be put uh, on the spot as if this is your problem, so they can discuss any developments quickly, in a timely way, and even elevate it to the, uh, to the foreign minister's level or to the leader's level as the situation is required. Otherwise, uh, like the, over the past, until recently, when the Korean Peninsula development was in the most uh, negative dynamics, uh, we didn't have any ASEAN, proper, timely ASEAN voice. You know, things were just happening. Uh, we do have uh, declarations uh, adopted in a very uh, uh, administrative uh, uh, manner, but without impact in terms of solution. And lastly, in terms of the people-centered ASEAN, I think this is where most, one of the most uh, uh, difficult challenge will be for ASEAN. Not in the economic domain. The economic domain, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there has been fundamental transformation, positive transformation in ASEAN's economy. In a way, uh, when we speak of the economies and commerce, there is the law or the dynamics of the, of the market forces. Uh, whatever the government say, things will happen because uh, economic actors and, and commerce uh, will, will have its own logic and momentum. But I'm speaking here of the people-centered ASEAN in the more governance and human rights dimension. Um, I thought, to be honest, in 2003 and 2015, when we finally have the ASEAN political security community, ASEAN has already have a good script. We manage to dispel the notion as if the internal and the external domain are separated, as if we can, you know, there is a fundamental division between internal development and external environment, as if we cannot have a conversation among one another, with one another on developments in one another's country's uh, situation. But through the ASEAN political security community, we develop capacities, we, de we develop outlook, uh, caring and sharing ASEAN, whereby we, we, we deem it uh, normal for ASEAN member states to express concern, to express interest in one another's development. The ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, ASEAN Co Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, all these capacities and possibilities are all out there. But again, as I said before, uh, these are all mere potentials. It requires hand-holding, it requires leadership, it requires prodding by the countries concerned to utilize them. But now, uh, what I'm seeing, uh, we are almost back to where we were before. The suggestion as if there is a, a night and day, uh, either or zero sum uh, uh, relationship between internal and external, a very strict interpretation of how one can manifest one's interest in internal developments of another neighboring countries, uh, and therefore, we are, we are not using the potential that we already have. And the cost of such an outlook is very clear. If you look at regions like in the Middle East, in North Africa, the original optimism brought forth by the uh, so-called Arab Spring, local developments quickly becoming national, regional, and then eventually even global uh, uh, problems. ASEAN have been fortunate so far in being able to maintain uh, the peace and stability in our region, to facilitate change in Indonesia, in the Philippines, democratic change without geopolitical repercussions. But uh, unless we get our script right, uh, unless we address the nexus between internal and external uh, domain in a proper way, then we will find ourselves uh, you know, trying to fix a problem that we could have avoided in the first place. But all in all, uh, does ASEAN matter? Indeed, yes, it has definitely mattered because that has been uh, objectively and clearly the case. But to continue to matter, 
complacency is the uh, is the, uh, the the threat. Uh, the ASEAN member states must cont must continue to be unified, must continue to be transformative in their outlook. But what gives me optimism, however, is that the obituary on ASEAN has been written on many many a times. I remember many many a moment in the past, post Cambodia. Uh, after during the South China Sea issue, etc., when people are saying, "Well, ASEAN is done, uh, it's divided, it's irrelevant," but somehow uh, we managed to reinvent ourselves. But it has, what I can assure the uh, uh, colleagues here is that it has come about not by accident. It has required leaders exercising leadership, uh, leaders demonstrate demonstrating courage to think outside the box. But if we have a situation uh, where policymakers are principally concerned with their own internal domestic setting, I can assure you that very quickly the external domain, the regional domain, the ASEAN setting can quickly grind to a halt. Those are what I wanted to share with our colleagues and friends, and I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? So I think that what you've just seen is that in contrast to many of the books on ASEAN that were published uh, in the last year or so to coincide with ASEAN's 50th anniversary that only extolled the virtues of ASEAN, this book is different. Um, this book is a call to action by the leaders of the countries from somebody extremely involved uh, in demonstrating and promoting the leadership that, that you indicate is so sorely uh, missing. Um, and so I would recommend the book to, uh, to all of you. Um, I'd like to maybe follow up mm -hmm. on a few things that, that you mention um, in the book because clearly uh, a key issue facing the broader region is the South China Sea issue, um, which you call mm -hmm. a litmus test for ASEAN. Um, and in the book, Dr. Narulagawa states that ASEAN's failure to mention collectively the victory for the Philippines, the decision by the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, in The Hague over the Philippines' claims against China was, and I use your term, deafening. <laughs> Um, and you state that the formal and public rejection of the award by China combined with ASEAN's silence um, creates the perception of acquiescence on the part of Southeast Asian states to China's position. Um, so we've been seeing facts change on the ground with building of artificial islands. Uh, we've also seen a lot of diplomatic activity on a code of conduct, but that seems to be taking a lot longer than many people would expect. Can I ask you what you would like to see more on the South China Sea issue? Um, yeah. Well, uh, there was a time, for some of you, when when we raised the issue of the South China Sea in ASEAN. This was back in the early 90s. I remember uh, as, a, as, a, as a junior diplomat, traveling with my bosses in the region, trying to alert countries of Southeast Asia of the need to manage the potential for conflict in the South China Sea. We were accused of being busybody, uh, of, of uh, trying to find some other pursuit for ASEAN after the Cambodian conflict. Uh, and of course, henceforth, we, it, we have been proven correct in the sense that actually, this was a clear case of a preventative uh, uh, a preventive diplomacy effort that was uh, very much needed, that we have an over a horizon, uh, a, a, a long-term perspective, trying to identify a, pro a potential for problem before they become even more serious. But from the very beginning, ASEAN, but thanks to those type of very early efforts in the 90s, ASEAN actually has managed to develop a common perspective uh, on the issue with China to be to be uh, to be uh, to be underscored the DOC in 2002 wasn't an ASEAN only instrument it was ASEAN and China and on the whole we have been able to manage uh, the dynamic as a, as a common 
a challenge for us and, and a common uh, uh, the need for the two of us, the two, the two sides, to find a common uh, solution uh, as well. But you know, in recent years, we have seen changing dynamics. I think China itself has become more assertive uh, for reasons uh, that's obviously quite complex, but it certainly we can, you can demonstratively and we can def define uh, the architecture that the China, China's more assertive role. And uh, ASEAN itself has become a little bit more fragile in terms of its uh, unity, a sense of unity of purpose. And um, the, when the Philippines began its own national efforts through the arbitration, to be honest, within ASEAN there was a sense of ambivalence. Uh, some ASEAN, quite a few ASEAN countries were rather unhappy actually to the Philippines that they, they had taken, you know, they have taken the issue out of ASEAN and taken, uh, go off on their own. But then uh, for the sake of ASEAN solidarity, we emphasize, well, this is uh, the Philippines' sovereign right to take the matter up with the tribunal, but we will continue to maintain ASEAN cohesion. But it wasn't without cost to ASEAN's uh, uh, dynamic unity within. But then when, once the um, arbitration uh, was uh, ruling was issued, situation changed in the Philippines. I'm just describing situations as it is. And the Philippines government itself changed its outlook. Now, uh, for the rest of, I know the inclination is that for the rest of ASEAN, uh, if the, the primary promulgator, the primary driver, itself has changed its view in terms of its outlook, then what are the rest of ASEAN uh, uh, you know, to say? I mean, they cannot be more the Philippines than the Philippines itself. But then once the issue is already out there, the genie is outside, out of the bottle. You know, we have no, to in my view, uh, this is more than simply the Philippines portfolio. It is now already out there. And for ASEAN not to be able to speak collectively on it, even to uh, to say speak collectively and expressively on it, to me is, is quite a, quite damaging. But it is what it is. It's a political reality. But now we are all focused on the code of conduct, uh, the the code of conduct on the South China Sea. Uh, recently, the, it's been celebrated. It's been it's, there's been a, a marked improvement uh, suggested in terms of the uh, consolidated uh, draft code of conduct on the South China Sea. But I, I'm more uh, concerned, or I have a footnote more, in terms of the way the code of conduct, as I am informed through re reading through reports, is that the, the draft code of conduct at the moment uh, manifests in official form the different position of Southeast Asian countries. You have China, and then you have square brackets, country A, country B, country C of ASEAN, which is uh, very efficient and very uh, illuminating in terms of a piece of paper, but it's not very thoughtful in terms of uh, strategy, in terms of ASEAN unity, uh, because we have always been behaving as a 10 vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, uh, but now we have a situation where uh, ASEAN countries' position have been uh, dissected. But in the end, in a way, the diplomatic pathway is, can become irrelevant in a way because <laughs> things are happening at sea. Uh, you know, things are, installations are being built, not just by China, but features are being altered by, by many sides. Uh, I know, of course, China is the most well-reported one. And then there's been potential for incidents when a few days ago, I think there was uh, US and Chinese, uh, China's uh, naval vessels coming so proximate to one another. So um, the diplomats uh, don't have all the time in the world to peruse through this document because things are happening at sea. Otherwise, they will have a wonderfully crafted document um, endorsed with consensus, but of the most minimum of relevance. Because the code of conduct is meant to be guide, is meant to be actionable. It's, non, it's no longer reiteration of all the good things that we promise one another, but it's how uh, naval officers and uh, shipping, uh, uh, shipping vessels and navies are to behave out there at sea. And I'm, from what I'm told, the current, doc the current draft may not pass that standard. It's more reiteration of we, are, we promise to be good with one another. 
but the devil is in the detail is how are you going to uh, uh, guide and and govern behavior at sea how are you going to manage crisis when it, it, it does occur when they do occur so this is where at where we are but ASEAN definitely needs to be even more united on this issue yeah. okay um, why don't we I have a lot more questions but I know that there are quite a number of people um, why don't I call on you can you just introduce yourself please uh, one and then two Speak up, please. Uh, I was, I'm Sam from yeah. the Greater Community, just interested in the talk. I was wondering if you could all speak to um, maybe a way that ASEAN could kind of, um, I guess, renew itself would be the accession of new members, such as East right. Timor. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yes, you, you have actually really uh, uh, highlighted one point that I also highlighted in the book, that at, there was a time when we achieved ASEAN 10, uh, we felt that that was it, that was the end of the project, because that's what the constituent elements of Southeast Asia were in terms of states. But then, of course, East Timor, that was then at one time province of Indonesia, uh, chose to go its own way, and we have the independent state of Timor Lest uh, as of 2002, if I'm not mistaken. And that's a new, a new dynamics, a new uh, equation. And um, Indonesia have been uh, pushing hard for East Timor-Leste admission to ASEAN, uh, especially ever since 2011, when East Timor-Leste itself formally, because obviously everything depends on the country concerned, if they wish or not, uh, then they actually formally submitted their application for membership, and Indonesia immediately seized on it. We said we, we need to have Timor-Leste joining ASEAN to become an ASEAN 11, not ASEAN 10. Um, but the consensus among ASEAN is still not there because all this decision, this uh, such a decision would need consensus by all. But in our in our um, talking points or in our in our in our in, in our argument, we say that look, East Timor geographically, Timor Leste geographically, is uh, is in Southeast Asia, which is one of the first requirement for membership of the western part of the island of. Uh, the eastern part of the island of Timor Leste, but more than simply <coughs> geography, the geopolitics and the geoeconomics. One cannot imagine a community in Southeast Asia, <coughs> which is South ASEAN, whether it be economic, whether it be political, that deliberately preclude a society, a state in this case, outside its scheme of things. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, how can you have a a community that there is uh, of that character. And not least of all, you may be aware that in the past, Indonesia and Timor-Leste has had a very difficult history. And, and here we are, two former, former protagonists, now asking ASEAN to, can you please um, codify, can you please bless uh, the transformation in our bilateral relationship? Uh, in other words, to lock in the positive process that we already have. Unfortunately, some of our colleagues in ASEAN was more preoccupied with the uh, mechanics, in, in especially in terms of what would the more less admission to ASEAN be the impact on the ASEAN economic community. Because they say the more less economy is at the different stage of development, it will have a repercussions on ASEAN's own economic community. But in the past, when we, when we expanded to include Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, their economy was also substantially different to ASEAN. We make that as a rail, uh, clarion call, as a railing call for us to, to have greater integration, not as an excuse to exclude. But given where we are now in terms of, at the moment there is a great deal of uh, concern within ASEAN, they say even the ASEAN 10, some, there's a school of thought in ASEAN that says, well, we, we made a mistake, not my, not my view, Someone, some people say we made a mistake by expanding ASEAN because now it's difficult, far more difficult to reach decisions on consensus. So given that atmosphere, I am speculating it will be even more difficult 
40 more or less to join now compared to say four or five years ago because uh, there is a hesitancy to take risk in, in opening up like a Pandora's box and having one more country make it more difficult to reach consensus. But uh, you are right, this is uh, an issue that is still out there that needs uh, a definite uh, uh, addressing, yeah. Okay, you please. I'm Nao Kokumara. I'm a visiting scholar here at the Weather Health East Asian Institute. And I'm also um, visiting from Southeast Asia, the Pest Rajana for International Studies in Singapore. Right. Um, I have a question about uh, the trade war between the US and China. I think that's one of the crises that's brewing <coughs> right now. And um, something that can affect ASEAN. Mm. Um, is there any discussion within ASEAN? I think I think actually that ASEAN may be in a position to be able to benefit from the crisis. Yeah. But is there a discussion collectively as ASEAN yeah. regarding this issue? Or you said um, earlier that ASEAN is quite, the countries are quite divided. Some are more pro-China, some are more pro-US. So um, I wonder if you have any insights that you can share. Well, yes, uh, the uh, repercussions of uh, US-China uh, trade war, I think it's a subject matter that's been discussed in many, many a quarter now, not just uh, in the United States itself, in China, <coughs> in Southeast Asia, and even beyond uh, elsewhere. Given the size of the two economies, uh, when this, if this situation was to, to worsen, uh, all of us will no doubt be impacted. Uh, I used to think, uh, well, I, I used to be focused on the potential negative impact because I, th I had thought that, well, the economies of United States, the economies of China may be impacted by may cause that there could be a slowdown and therefore that will have uh, uh, indirect impact, direct and indirect impact on the economies of ASEAN. But then again, uh, some, since then, I've met some actual business leaders, commerce, uh, who say that actually there's also opportunity. Actually, along the line, someone was telling me that actually a lot of uh, uh, businesses that had been invested in China, uh, having doing most of their business with the United States, are now relocating elsewhere to the Philippines, to uh, Vietnam, to Indonesia. So there's also potential gain. But I think on the whole, whether it's uh, positive or negative, uh, it can never be good to have two such huge economies be in such a dispute, right? I mean, so we need to see this as a problem, as a challenge to be addressed. Now, I am not privy because I've been out of government for the past four years, and I'm not privy, I'm not informed of the, how the issue is being discussed actually in ASEAN uh, circles. But going by formal, formal statements from meet, emanating from meetings, oral as well as in written form. What I'm concerned about is that most of the uh, expressions of views have been like a commentary. They express concern about the trade war, the potential impact. What I'm missing is given that, what are you doing uh, about it? Uh, this is in contrast to what happened before. In 2008, there was prospect of financial crisis. Uh, 1998, obviously, the so-called Asian financial crisis, we learned a tremendous lot from it. But when 2008 happened, or about to happen, Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN, to the ASEAN itself, ASEAN plus three, East Asia Summit, G20 eventually, we were proactive. We made sure that this, this uh, countries concerned, they are there with us. You know, when you have the ASEAN plus three, uh, you have China, we have the uh, East Asia Summit, China and, and United States are in the room. Uh, APEC, of course, is not as ASEAN proper, but also another forum. In the past, those forums were utilized, to be honest. We, we weren't simply lamenting, we weren't simply feeling sorry for ourselves, all oh, these things are happening and therefore what can we do? So we actually did something. This was called um, uh, economic diplomacy. And, and nowadays, economic diplomacy is being interpreted more as a, like a mercantilist 
export import you know you to, you go try to have more sales for your products but actually multilateral economic diplomacy was in motion at the time but I'm not sure to what extent now ASEAN leaders and beyond ASEAN has that same degree of ambition uh, just one final, final point all of us are now uh, impacted by the uh, going back and forth of the uh, Federal Reserve, the exchange rate, the impact on our currencies, etc. But yet many of our economies are taking steps that are national in nature. Like you are drawing the line in the sand, but in the, in the most immediate, right in front of your very home, so to speak, so that we already write down, if you have a policy menu from A to Z, A to Z, uh, 1 to 10, we are already, and then with the level of gradation, 10 being the most direct to you, we, are, we jump from immediately to 10. There is not, there is actually a, a level of steps, remedial steps, that we can take at the regional level, and I'm, I'm, I'm missing it. So every, everyone is doing like a mercantilist, beggar thy neighbor, almost a 1930s free, uh, you know, during the Depression era, everyone taking care of themselves, not realizing that by you're simply magnifying and worsening a general trend. And sometimes it can make for a rather uh, odd situation where one country, you know, go to another country, say, complaining, how come you're raising tariffs against our products, and then you're using the same instrument at home against their product. So there is sometimes this like a uh, inconsistency in our outlook, championing free trade when it suits us, uh, but then raising all kind of tariffs and non-tariff barriers uh, for our own national situation. So, in short, I'm not privy to the national, the most recent ASEAN discussions, but I'm hopeful and uh, I hope uh, they will. Because, the, for instance, now in Indonesia, in Bali, the, there's going to be a World Bank IMF conference. I, I gather ASEAN leaders are going to be there at the sideline of the World Bank IMF meetings. What a precious opportunity for ASEAN leaders to speak out loud collectively. Uh, uh, we cannot go down this route of mercantilist, uh, beggar their neighbor, uh, trade tariff imposition. Let's fix this problem before it becomes more serious. But it requires a policy outlook of that type. Uh, Marty, Dan Moss, yes. good to see you. Just to pick up on that, yeah. didn't the regional response in 98, yeah. I was in KL yes. at the time, not yes. Jakarta, but didn't that require the IMF and its larger shareholders mm -hmm. to be midwife to that, whereas right now you don't have that? Yeah. Whereas if you had an EU type structure with common regulatory mm -hmm. framework, common central yeah. bank, etc., I mean, is that what's really needed to get a regional response? You need someone acting as midwife or a regional economic structure, not just diplomatic, yeah. to do that? Well, I think the 1998 episode was a wake-up call to, to all of us right? in, in many different ways and forms. Uh, within ASEAN, it was a wake-up call in terms of uh, it's not all about the economy. Uh, just when we speak of ASEAN community, three-pillar ASEAN community, Sociocultural, political security, because economy, you can have e economic material progress, but that may not suffice. We need to have resilience in the political economic domain, hence, we've had this three pillar ASEAN way project. But even in the economic domain, actually, from 1998 onward, we have developed some degree of us regional capacities. The Chiang Mai uh, initiative, uh, the, uh, all the various efforts that we took on the energy, uh, on food security, uh, in the food security domain. On, on the currency swap uh, capacities as well. But these are capacities which are our outlook or, or, or recourse that are unlike the EU is less institutionalized. It's, it seems to me it's more uh, moment specific, generation leadership specific. I, I thought, to be honest, uh, ASEAN community and all that is sufficiently robust sufficiently already in motion that uh, come what may, whoever come and goes, we already have the wherewithal. 
but apparently not because the, we are actually seeing real impact of, of how the coming and goings <coughs> of leadership of leaders can impact on how to what extent the regional solution are, is being invoked but uh, uh, yes the um, so I wouldn't say there is a total lacune that there is a total vacuum of regional level uh, response instruments we learn our lessons we draw our lessons learned from 1998 we have it but then the point that I'm trying to say like in the political domain are we invoking it are we sufficiently mindful of the fact that we have capacities here at the regional level mm, that we need to invoke because otherwise uh, we are we will be going back and forth um, I remember for instance Thailand and, and Indonesia and Vietnam uh, Vietnam, I think recently, because they have to comply with certain ASEAN economic community requirement, uh, had to lower their automotive uh, tariff, importation of automotive. And then, because the tariff went down, they immediately introduced non-tariff barriers uh, about safety regulation days. And Indonesia protested on, on that. They said, oh, this will impact on our automotive export to, to Vietnam. And yet, uh, uh, such a recourse to non-tariff uh, efforts is not the monopoly of uh, Vietnam. <laughs> All of us are, are not entirely guilt-free from that kind of efforts. Yeah. Niwa. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Niwa. I'm second year here at CIPA, and also board member of Southeast Asia Student Initiative, where we actually hosted Prof. Kishore Mabutani right. talking about Asia last semester. Uh, after reading some part of your books mm -hmm. uh, and listening to your remark earlier. I, I come with two questions mm -hmm. uh, for you. The first one would be about part of the book that you wrote mentioning about the business working of ASEAN, the three notion of business working as in the two speed, the ASEAN oh, yes. member states and CLMV, the compartmentalization of that, and the three tiered work, the three pillars of ASEAN, and thirdly about the ASEAN minus X. So my question is about this notion of ASEAN working process, if we compare uh, the way how it works back in your tenure and then right now, given the fact that there are new dynamics in the Pacific and that the US administration and the Trump and whatnot, how do you think this notion has, will be uh, perceived by the ASEAN members in terms of the way how things work? Maybe most of the thing that happened back in the day was about economy, mm -hmm. but the most intractable issues in ASEAN is also about political security. Absolutely. Have you seen anything in regards to that? And my second question is about the, the fact that you said chairmanship is not the same with leadership, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, but there is a reason why the chairmanship system, the rotating chairmanship mm -hmm. system in ASEAN is there. And one of your, the part of your book also mentioned about how uh, you at the time was also extremely involved in the way how Thailand Cambodian mediation good offices uh, mechanism work and right now the system of regional mechanism is also already there but it is not being involved in dealing with a number of issues but how if comparing that period to now why do you think right now ASEAN member states has that confidence to actually invoke that regional me mechanism while at a time, it didn't work, right? Thank you. Well, well th thank you very much. I, I guess your first question uh, relates to essentially modalities, ASEAN modalities, uh, especially its decision-making modalities. Uh, recently, it has become quite fashionable and quite uh, in vogue uh, to lament on the ASEAN consensus uh, decision-making modality, uh, basically saying, well, this is a, a recipe for non-decision, uh, and uh, uh, ASEAN in drift because uh, and essentially you give every member state of ASEAN a power of veto because the, if one member state express reservation then the whole project can grind to a halt and, and hence there was uh, there is a one school of thought that suggests well maybe we should proceed to an ASEAN minus X uh, principle for instance where uh, we, want, we can have a situation where sufficient uh, you can have a situation where we don't need to have consensus on every uh, decision-making uh, uh, situation. But you know, I think we in s 
in making this kind of suggestion, one should not uh, fail to recognize that uh, even in the past, uh, ASEAN divisions or variations within ASEAN uh, was a fact of life. Uh, it's, it's not as if now we are in a totally new environment where we are especially difficult with one another, that we are so problematic with one another that we, it's impossible to have decision. I can assure you that has always been the case. Uh, you know, Palatas, uh, my predecessor uh, as foreign minister when he was dealing with the Cambodian conflict in the 80s, and Pa Hassan Wirayuda, Pa Al Shihab, and many others, and then of course Ibu know as now, uh, we, we have to take divisions or variation in our outlook as a given. That is a fact of life. You can't wish these things away. But then uh, it is, uh, depends then on the diplomacy, on, on the quality of the diplomacy to try to overcome this. Uh, the power of one's persuasion. You can't simply give up and say, oh, this, this whole thing is too difficult. Mm, it's impossible to reach decision. Let's change the, uh, the way we take decisions. Because I think it is incumbent on, on the ASEAN leaders, ASEAN diplomats, to work harder. And this is the point that I, I am a little bit concerned about now, is that while the divisions or the, the variation among ASEAN countries is, is, is a long-standing one, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a long-standing one, what is new now is the tendency to accept this reality, as a, to accept this reality. Uh, in other words, to take division, uh, lack of consensus, as the new normal. There is no longer a sense of agitation when we see a, a, an obvious division to want to fix it. Uh, in 2012, remember, as I tried to explain in the book, in Cambodia, terrible one, one of the worst experiences that I've, I've had as a diplomat, when ASEAN failed for the first time to issue a statement. Uh, but then, within 48 hours, we were off again trying to fix it. And then we somehow we managed to fix it. We, we managed to restore ASEAN unity. But what I'm seeing now, uh, and I, I, I hope I'm incorrect, uh, there is a readiness to live with the divisions. As if when divisions occur, no one is picking up the mantle and say, look, we have to resolve this. As if there is a denial, uh, as if we just move on to new issues. And this is what worries me, a sense of complacency, a sense of uh, things, uh, things being uh, let be. Uh, this is what. Uh, but I, th I don't think it's a mechanical issue. I don't think it's a procedural issue because uh, there is a school of ASEAN. We love. They love to uh, to go on drafting exercises. Uh, you know, I mean, you could just send these officials to the. Oh, can you have a guideline on how ASEAN make this? They can spend the next two, three years <laughs> sitting down <laughs> over a piece of paper. But uh, the problem is not in the mechanics. I think the, the challenge is in, in the efforts that we have to put in. And exasperation is not policy. Uh, emotion is not policy. You, you, can't, you can't get upset by, by the imp impossibility of the situation. You have to go on and on and on, persevere until you get it. But the, your second point is very much related on the rotating presidency. It is. It has been very important, actually, the, the rotating uh, chairmanship of ASEAN. Very important in, in developing a sense of ownership uh, in ASEAN project. You could well imagine, if we do not have a rotating presidency or chairmanship, um, and uh, you know, there is less sense of uh, participation, a sense of ownership. Many, many countries don't realize that some of the most recent ASEAN members, like Myanmar and you know, Cambodia, they're actually quite recent. ASEAN members, but they've been so efficiently absorbed uh, in ASEAN ways, uh, notwithstanding some notable footnotes, uh, that actually there is a great deal of uh, ownership in the process. So the rotating chairmanship is very important. This is probably not too efficient, but politically it's important to build a sense of ownership and participation in ASEAN project. What, this, uh, what that leads to, however, is the need to have continuity. Because sometimes, whenever you have a new chair, you have your own projects. You have to have. You want to have your own deliverables. Uh, when you have an ASEAN summit, ASEAN foreign ministers, you want to count how many declarations you issue. Or oh, our presidency issued 27 declarations. Oh, your one is only 21. So that becomes <laughs> like an index of index of how 
how proactive you've been, how busy you've been, how successful you've been. Uh, in our one, uh, when Indonesia was sharing us, and said, look, don't go by numbers. If we can just have one, at least meaningful impact. And uh, thankfully, in Indonesia's case, though I'm not impartial, most of our uh, chairmanship, the impact has been beyond our year. You know, when you look, 1976, the TAC, Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, in Bali, first ASEAN summit, the impact is felt even until now, beyond our chairmanship year. 2002-2003, ASEAN community, we launched the process, the three-pillar ASEAN community, the impact is still being felt now. Uh, 2011, we began the ASEAN community, the global community of nations, ASEAN having common voice on global issues, still aspirational in nature, but again beyond the year. So in other words, uh, we need to ensure that each chairmanship is impactful, but also continuity. But thankfully now ASEAN is so efficient. We have so many plans of actions, uh, multi-year, yeah? multi-year plans of actions, multi-year uh, uh, visions. So if they go by the script, uh, on the whole, we should get to where we, should, we want to go. But then again, we have these intervening chairmen who will have their own priorities and concerns. But uh, it will be for the ASEAN Secretariat in particular as the uh, institutional memory holder to be able to advise uh, of the, uh, the elements of continuity in our endeavor. Yeah. I just want to make a comment. Mm -hmm. um, Minister Nadalagawa mentioned um, how ASEAN diplomats could spend months and we years we love drafting doing this documents yeah, yeah. and everything. <laughs> and yet one of the key things that came through in your book was that in the task of negotiating some of the critical issues, whether it be uh, forging mm -hmm. um, uh, conflict resolution <coughs> between Thailand and Cambodia over the border temple in 2011, um, or uh, coming to an ASEAN consensus uh, after the Cambodian uh, debacle in 2012, was that you did not put things on paper. Yeah, you engaged absolutely. in shuttle diplomacy, you got agreement from one country, yeah. you shared your views, you managed consensus, and then put a few words on paper on which parties could yeah. then agree, mm -hmm. because had you put words on paper... That would be the end of it, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> because, I thought... Yeah, because that, that's actually what some of it is. Uh, an experience that I learned here at the UN, at the uh, Security Council, when we twice in this Indonesia as a member of the Security Council, when every word matter, how you present uh, your views, and uh, especially as President of the Security Council, uh, you know, when when you start putting uh, thoughts onto paper, everyone wants to go into a, a drafting exercise. And likewise in ASEAN as well in 2012, because we went through a good number of drafts. In the end, we were just going back and forth in circle. So in the end, when <coughs> I did go around the ASEAN capitals, I said, look, I'm, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to have any paper. Mm -hmm. uh, just I'm going to be, I am going to simply listen to what they have to say. Uh, I, I don't want to say too much, I just want to listen, absorb, and then at the end of it all, I have my impressions. Uh, the term I use is impressions. This is my impressions. You, unless they violently uh, disagree, uh, then hopefully they can just leave, uh, you know, let it go, go through. So that was just that, just, uh, just impressions. And perfection can be the enemy of the good. If you put everything onto paper, people become even more agitated to want to improve things. And one other, other thing about drafting is that in ASEAN, especially for Indonesia, I'm not sure Indonesia as a country, but certainly for me as a person, uh, sometimes it's best not to seek perfection in everything that we do in terms of outcome. So every document, every effort must have sufficient degree of room for improvement by others uh, so that there is a sense of ownership uh, in the project. You don't want to come with a, such a perfectly uh, crafted document that they, all they can say is, well, okay, you've done it all, but then they don't feel ownership in the process. It's best to have uh, not 100% document, countries can still chip in with their ideas, with their thoughts, so then you have everyone on board. And this is where sometimes our Ind Indonesians don't realize, to be honest, I'm talking more to within, uh, the type of leadership Indonesia has to exercise within ASEAN, given its size, often less is more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have
have to be a bit more nuanced, a little bit more uh, calibrated uh, to know when to step in, when to uh, step back.